today on Adventures in Faith with Jerry Savell. Where are you receiving your greatest influence? From the world or from the Word? Who and what influences you the most? Who and what forms your opinions? Let's open our Bibles this morning, uh, first of all, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And what I want to share with you this morning is simply entitled, In Troubled Times, Stick with the Word of God. In Troubled Times, Stick with the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you have found it, let's look at verse one. This also or know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of that, but I do want to drop down to verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou has learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou has learned them. So notice the apostle Paul considers the most important thing that we can do in perilous times is stick to what we've learned. Amen. Now, if you haven't learned anything, you're in trouble. But I've learned a few things. I am entering in, starting in February, my 53rd year in the ministry. And I have learned a lot in those 53 years. And I might also add, I'm still doing the things that I learned when I first began 53 years ago. I'm still applying the same principles. You go back and listen to sermons I've preached in the early 70s, I'm still preaching the same thing. I just know more. I've experienced more. But the message is the same. I haven't, I haven't altered the message in the least. Why? Because it's the Word of God. And it works. And the Word of God is eternal. Amen. So I am determined to keep doing and applying what I've learned because all these years it has worked for me. That's right. right. How many of you have learned something over the last few years? How many of you have learned something if this is your church? How many of you have learned something since you started attending this church? I'm glad you lifted your head and your pastor's watching. (laughs) I'd hate to think that Justin's been doing all this fine preaching and you haven't learned anything. Look at Pastor Justin and say, oh, thank you, Pastor, for teaching us the word. Amen. Now, the Amplified Bible says in verse 1, But understand this, that in the last days will come or set in perilous times. Now, the Amplified Bible defines perilous times as times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. But notice it did not say impossible. They're not impossible to deal with. And they're not impossible to bear. Now that's something you have to decide. That's right. Amen. You can either decide this is impossible, it's too hard to bear, or you can go with a word and say it's hard, but not impossible. Not impossible. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's hard. It's, hard. it's, not, impossible. it's not impossible. Amen. Now, it goes on to say in the Amplified, but as for you... Verse 14, continue to hold to the things that you have learned. And obviously he's talking about what you've learned from the word of God. Now the New Living Translation says, you must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. Remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. Now I I consider myself to have done that. I've remained faithful to the things that I have been taught. First of all, learning them from Kenneth Copeland back in 1969, Kenneth Hagin back in 1969, Oral Roberts as far back as 1969, and T.L. Osborne. Those were my four mentors. Those were the men that I learned from in the early days of, of my life in Christ. And I'm still applying those same principles. Notice Paul said, 
uh, and, and remember who you learned them from. I still support all those ministries. I'm still a partner with all those ministries. Amen. I will be until the day I go to heaven. Why? Because the Bible says that if you honor God, he will honor you. And I honor God for sending those men into my life. I don't think I would be what I am today if God had not sent those men to me. In fact, I know I wouldn't be what I am today. But it's one thing for God to send anointed ministers to you, but it's something else to receive what they say and then apply it to your life. Because there were a lot of people back in 1969 in the church that we were attending, the church Carolyn grew up in. I began attending after I surrendered my life to the Lord. There were a lot of people that heard those same messages and they didn't apply them. They didn't receive them. In fact, Kenneth Copeland made half of them mad because he kicked over all their sacred cows. He, he, he certainly was not religious. And that, that just didn't sit well with a lot of them. Now, I, it's amazing to me, you know, uh, people that don't like Brother Copeland. <laughs> and there's a multitude of them. And most of them have never heard what he said. That's like uh, the first time I, I had the opportunity to begin preaching back in those early days before I actually moved to Fort Worth and went to work with Brother Copeland. Uh, I was invited to come to Oklahoma City and preach in a church. And, and after the service, the, brother, uh, the pastor said, uh, Brother Savell, you're just a Kenneth Copeland clone. Why don't you get your own message? Well, I wasn't sure what a clone was. I had to go look in the dictionary, you know. And, and, and so when I got back home, uh, Brother Copeland called, and he wanted me to meet him, uh, Carolyn and I, to meet him in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. He was preaching a meeting down there, and he wanted me to come and join him. And uh, so we, we drove to Jacksonville Beach. And I had the opportunity to tell Brother Copeland what that pastor had said. And Brother Copeland said, now, what church was that in Oklahoma City? I told him, he said, what was that pastor's name? I told him, he said, oh, I preached there when I first went to ministry. And he told me I was nothing but a Kenneth Hagin clone. <laughs> Why don't you get your own message? Amen. Well, the message Brother Copeland preached was working for him. Amen. The message Brother Hagin preached was working for him. Amen. The Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen? Well, I'm just being obedient to the Bible. Follow those. Uh, when Carol and I moved here, uh, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland had been in the ministry. Uh, they started in, in uh, 67. And, of course, I surrendered my life in 69. And we moved here. And they'd been in the ministry about three or four years. So they were that far ahead of us. But they were our example. We saw them. I not only heard him preach it. Now, back then, when we went on meetings, we didn't go for one night anywhere. Three weeks. Three services a day. Brother Copeland used to say, it takes a week to break through all the unbelief. The second week, people start listening to what you say. And the third week, we have a move of God. So I heard those sermons three times a day for three weeks. Not only that, but... I had the uh, <clears throat> duplicators in my hotel room, and I'd take that message that he preached, bring it back to my room. And, of course, this is back on reel-to-reel -reel days, and I would duplicate the message in case somebody wanted to purchase a copy of it. And if, if, if there were five people that ordered a message, I had to duplicate that five times. And if the message was an hour long, it took an hour to duplicate it. So I heard those messages not only when he preached them, but at least four or five times again in my room. Wow. That's the way you can get the word in you in abundance. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, boy, when they started, you know, when, when people started buying them, you know, 20 people, 30 people, 40 people, thank God, Brother Copeland believed for a duplicator, they'd do five at a, man, five at a time. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'd have to be up all night long duplicating. But those messages were changing my life. 
Amen. I, I didn't understand. Now, people would say sometimes, <clears throat> they have to understand back in those early days, there was Kenneth Copeland, Gloria Copeland, A.W. Copeland, Brother Copeland's dad. He was like the general manager of the ministry, a secretary and a bookkeeper, and Jerry Savelle. That was the staff of Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association. Okay? And I went everywhere the Copelands went. They didn't go anywhere without me. I was we Savelle. When Brother Copeland said, we going to do this, we going to do that, I was we Savelle. Okay? So, so uh, I would drive that station wagon <laughs> loaded down with the sound system and the duplicating equipment and the books and tapes. Well, you only had one book back in those days. And then I would set up the auditorium wherever we went. And back in those days, it was usually a, a small hotel room that might seat 100 people, you know, and I'd set up the sound system and all that. And then it was my job to also find a piano player in that city where Brother Copeland could sing. Uh, and his, his theme song back then was more about Jesus. And he sang it in every meeting. More, more about Jesus. And I had to find a piano player that could play where he could sing that song. I remember one time, I couldn't find anybody. I searched and I asked. And they finally told me this lady could play the piano. <clears throat> <clears throat> after the service, Brother Copeland said, <clears throat> after the service, Brother Copeland said, don't you ever get me another piano player that's only got three fingers. <laughs> she was awful. I could have played better than her. But anyway, uh, and then after Brother Copeland would sing, I'd get back up and open the service while he got ready and uh, maybe receive the offering. And then I would go sit on the platform and I'd sit, had a little desk with the amplifier I mean, the, uh, yeah, the amplifier and the recorder. I put on a headset. And when Brother Copeland got ready to preach, he'd turn around and say, turn me on, Jerry. So that was my cue to turn the recorder on. Make sure I'm getting a good recording. So every service I heard, turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. And I'd just like to announce, if it hadn't been for Jerry Savelle, Kenneth Copeland, would have never got turned on. <laughs> Now, I'm listening to those messages. That was my Bible college. As soon as I knew I had a good recording, I took the headset off, and now I'm his best student. I listen to every word. I took notes on every sermon. In fact, sometimes people would ask me after the sermon, what were you so mad about? I said, mad? I wasn't mad. Well, it sure looked like it. The look on your face... I said, no, I was, I was, I was listening, you know, I, I didn't want to miss a word and I'm taking notes and uh, every word was changing my life. Every message was changing my life. Now, Carolyn didn't get to go very often. And so I would come home and I'd endeavor to share what I had learned in those meetings with her so that our faith would be on the same level because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, from time to time, he would allow Carolyn to come and she would work at the tape tables and all that and be in the services. And, and, uh, and, and it was always exciting. We couldn't get enough. Yeah. Couldn't get enough. I was like a sponge. And yet I would see people who would get up and leave during the service. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then, so they couldn't play with a cell phone <laughs> like they do today. While you're preaching, Come on, that's the truth. playing games, texting other people. <laughs> but you could, you could tell they were preoccupied with something else. I never will forget, we were in Dayton, Ohio, 1973. Somebody said, how do you remember all this? Because... Every service made an impact on me. Yeah. Yeah. And I started confessing the first time I heard Kenneth Hagin. 
I'm going to have a memory like Kenneth Hagin. That man could remember everything. He'd say things like, you know, back in 1954, uh, May the 12th, you remember May the 12th was a Thursday? <laughs> I thought, how does he remember all that? And I started confessing, I'm going to have a memory like Kenneth Hagin. Well, anytime Kenneth Copeland Ministries needs to know something about the history of the ministry, they call me. I was the historian, okay? Now, so uh, people would people would listen sometimes. Other people would listen the entire time. And then some people would allow themselves to be preoccupied and never heard a word. And this one time in, in Dayton, Ohio, this man came up to me and he said, I need to talk to Kenneth Copeland. I said, well, sir, he's getting ready to preach and and it's not likely you'll be able to talk to him before he preaches. Well, I have questions. I said, well, sir, if you'll sit and listen to the message, he'll probably answer your questions in the message. No, I can't wait. I've got to have answers now. I said, well, sir, that's not going to happen. But I can promise you that if you will sit and listen and, and have an open heart to receive, Brother Copeland will probably answer your question. I said, he's done it for me many times. I, I remember when I first moved here, I, I, had, I, had to, I needed an answer to something. And I was with Brother Copeland's mother. I said, Vanetta, I need to talk to Brother Copeland. She said, well, don't, don't, don't think I'm going to arrange it for you. <laughs> she was tougher than a boot. <laughs> He said, I, if I have questions, I pray in the Spirit. He picks it up. Pray in the Spirit. He'll pick it up. Praise God. Oh, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why don't I just ask him? <laughs> well, she said, I'm not going to set it up for you. Don't, don't look at me to make it happen for you. Just pray in the Spirit. He'll pick it up. And sure enough, I prayed in the Spirit and said, Lord, have him pick this up. And the next service I was in, he answered my question. <clears throat> and I told that man this. He said, well, I, I don't have time. I need to talk to him now. I said, well, sir, I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Now, I will arrange for you to have a front row seat if you'll just stay and listen. I said, can you do that? If, if it's that important to you, make a way. Yeah. He said, okay. I talked him into it. He sat down on the front row. Brother Copeland was this far, and just, just close to him, preaching. And I noticed in a little while, the man got up and walked out. I got up and followed him. I said, sir, why did you leave? He said, I need answers. I don't have time to stay for a service. I said, well, sir, if you would just sit there and listen, I am confident he will answer your question. I said, what is your question? He told me. I said, come on and sit back down. Brother Copeland will pick it up in the spirit. He wouldn't come in. I went back in, sat there, and Brother Copeland answered his question in about five minutes. Wow. But he never heard it. Wow. He was outside in the car getting ready to leave. Wow. See, sometimes God is speaking and you're not hearing. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. God may be speaking to some of you right now. But if you're so preoccupied with what you're going through, it's not likely you'll hear the solution. Can you say amen? amen. I'm not trying to be hard this morning. I'm just, I'm just telling you facts. Amen. I've been at this a while. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> amen. So listen. Why would you come to church and not listen? I tell people, when you come to church, bring three things. Number one, your Bible. Number two, a notebook. And number three, seed. Amen. That's the three most important things you can bring to church. Your Bible, a notebook. Now, that, goes, that, that dates me. You can bring your iPad and iPhone and your pad and my phone, whatever. <laughs> so you can take notes, anything to take notes on. And a seed. Amen. 
Amen. Don't ever come to church without seed. Amen. Even if it's a little sum, sow a seed. Amen. You know what Carla does? Every time Carla comes to the service, and particularly if I'm here, she will walk up to me and hand me a seed. And she said, this is my hearing seed. I'm expecting to hear from God today. Glory to God. Do you hear from God when I preach, Carl? Every time. Every time. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Just a little humor there. No, she plants the seed. I don't ever come to church without my Bible, something to take notes on, and seed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, now, the Passion Translation says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, talking about perilous times, it says, don't let it phase you. Stick with what you learned and believed. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way. I love that. Let me read it again. Don't let what's happening in the world right now phase you. Stick with what you believed, stick with what you learned and believed. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way. Amen. Now, Jesus said this in John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. The Passion Translation says, if my words live powerfully in you. If my words live powerfully in you. And powerfully here means to the point of strongly influencing you. To the point of strongly influencing you. Now, I have a question. Where are you receiving your greatest influence? From the world or from the Word? <laughs> Who and what influences you the most? Who and what forms your opinions? The world or the Word? It should be the Word. Amen. Amen. To be influenced by the world is to invite failure and defeat into your life. To be influenced by the word is to position yourself for victory and success. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Now let's go to Matthew chapter 14 for a moment. Matthew chapter 14. Let's look at a man, a story of a man who allowed some outside things to influence him. Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answering him said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. You know the story. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Notice it does not say when Peter got out of the ship and put his feet on the water, he began to sink. Doesn't say that at all. It says when Peter got out on the water, he began walking to Jesus. So, what's happening here? With the influence of God's Word, 
He could do the impossible. When times of trouble arise, how can you reject worry and doubt? How can you stay positive and continue trusting God in faith? Today's special offer, the Stay Positive During Troubled Times special package, contains Jerry Savelle's captivating book, Thoughts, The Battle Between Your Ears, his three-part audio series, Win or Lose by Your Attitude, and his single CD, Throw in the Towel or Stick It Out. In this package, Jerry teaches how to have a good attitude in a bad circumstance, how to press beyond your breaking point, and the tool that brings success every time. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the Stay Positive During Troubled Times special package. Your attitude will cause you to fail or to succeed in every area of life. Let Jerry help you develop a positive, hopeful, expectant attitude no matter what is going on around you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you watching and I want to encourage you to make your plans to join with us again next week and for the next few weeks talking about staying positive in troubled times. These are important messages, particularly for the time in which we live. You know, there's so many negative things happening around us. All the news is negative. The newspaper's negative. The media is negative. But you have the ability to stay positive if you will fill your heart and fill your mind with the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, join with me again as we continue talking about how that you can stay positive in troubled times. And also I want to help you through the resources we have available at this time. My book entitled Thoughts, The Battle Between Your Ears. That's where all the battles are fought, right between your ears, in your mind. Some of the chapters that we discuss is planting positive thoughts, casting down negative thoughts, renewing your mind, maintaining your train of thought in a positive way. And then this one I like, the closing chapter, Thinking Bigger Thoughts. That's all in this little book, Thoughts, the Battle Between Your Ears. Then also, uh, most of you have heard me say in the past, I'm a boxing enthusiast. One of the things that you would see in boxing from time to time, when the, when the corner thinks that their fighter cannot continue, they'll throw in the towel. Well, you have a choice. You can either throw in the towel or you can stick it out. That's the title of this special CD. Throw in the towel or stick it out. And then finally, win or lose by your attitude. How you look at life circumstances will determine whether you win or lose. These are all excellent uh, resources that you can order from our website, jerrysavelle.org, and all the other information you need will be on the website or you can look on the screen right now. Thank you once again for joining me today and I look forward to sharing with you once again on next week's broadcast. It's going to be powerful, so don't miss it. Amen and amen.